Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we can break down the lessons we can learn as DMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 29, Whispers. As the episode opens, Laura and Travis are on their way from the airport, and Keyleth has begun her eight-hour ritual to restore the sun tree. So the rest of the party has to occupy themselves with other things. Vax stitches the symbol of Saren Ray into the back of his glove, and then he, Percy, and Scanlan go to a temple to try to find some allies. There are two temples in town. The first one they go to is the Zenith, a temple to Paylor. It's designed like a fairly typical church with a graveyard. They get to the door, and it doesn't give. It seems like it's been barred from the inside. And thus begins a sequence where three grown men try really hard to open a door. Scanlan uses Dimension Door to get into the church, but he's too weak to lift the bar that's across the door. The boys slide a sword through the door to try to lift the bar, but they fail, and Scanlan slices his hand open. Although something to note, it seems like Matt was going to suggest that, but Sam is actually the one who adds that detail. Because Sam generally has no problem with failing. Even in this scenario, he discusses spending a spell to lift the bar, like Bigby's hand, but says he wants to follow through on the use the sword idea. This could be for any number of reasons. Is he trying to conserve spells since Bigby's hand is overkill for a problem like a door? Is he trying to honor the choices of another player and try not to solve the problem single-handed, no pun intended? Or is he just being a troll because he knows the sword plan probably won't work? I don't know, but the point is, we get this extended scene, which is truly ridiculous. Because we're only partway through. Vax parkours up the wall and climbs in through a broken window and tries to help Scanlan lift the bar. Scanlan also summons an unseen servant to help them. And once again, they fail. Roll again and add five. Oh, I see. You got a six. Four. <laughs> so that's uh, nine. <laughs> the, 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 the three of you, one mystically summoned from a plane beyond Can't your own, it. cannot seem to budge this single wooden door. You've defeated beholders. <laughs> You've, you've, you've sl slaughtered a villain <laughs> underneath the, uh, the Underdark, deep in the belly of the planet. Day. But this door bests you. Man, Laura and Travis ain't missing shit. <laughs> All right, I'm doing it. Step back. Uh, whip out the hand. Uh, 12. Plus 8 to it. Plus 8? 20. How do you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> One of his fingers just goes... And it... <laughs> The door overkill. opens up and Percy stands there looking not Was it happy. overkill? Because really it took that. It took three it's, spells it's, it's to exactly open this door! It took. Three it's spells! Not, it's not overkill if you use what it took. <laughs> three spells and I injured myself. <laughs> Honestly, I could have filled this entire video with clips from just this sequence. It is just so much fun. So I do encourage you to go watch this scene. It's a hoot. They begin to investigate the temple and they see that the glass was smashed in. Something broke into the temple. Our party finds a brazier with some embers still burning inside, so someone was here recently. They find a piece of unburned paper, a journal entry from someone who was trying to recreate a weapon based on eyewitness accounts. Their first efforts were faulty and cost the author their hand. But thankfully for the author, the inventor of this weapon is apparently on their way to Whitestone. Vax quickly deduces that someone is trying to copy Percy's weapon. They also find the body of Father Raynal, dead in his chambers. And then a strange howling wind sound, but no wind, fills the room, and the room gets cold. And then a shimmering, ethereal elven woman appears. Scanlan and Percy turn invisible, but the banshee still locks eyes with them. And we roll initiative, so here are some highlights. Vax throws three daggers, but actually he clarifies he throws the same dagger three times, since he replaced the other two daggers on his belt with wooden stakes. Matt doesn't seem to hear this, so Liam admits... Well, okay, the daggers probably wouldn't come back to my belt that fast, so I could throw them again on the same turn. So he retcons and clarifies that the second and third hit were from wooden stakes. He actually clarifies it twice. Matt didn't seem to hear him or at least understand him the first time. And Liam is trying to be as honest as possible. So Matt realizes, oh, well, yeah, if you threw two wooden stakes, then those did no damage. But again, Liam gets points for honesty in my book. The Banshee wails, and anyone who succeeded on the save took some psychic damage. But because Percy failed his save, he just drops unconscious immediately. No damage, just immediate unconsciousness. That is a nasty ability. Pure save or suck territory. But Scanlan is able to heal him, thankfully. Percy isn't fully dead from the scream. Oh, and on his next turn, Liam realizes he didn't even have time to click his boots of haste, so he couldn't have thrown three times previously anyway. No damage needs to be rolled back. He didn't, you know, do any damage with the second and third hit, but again... Points for honesty. The Banshee knocks Percy out again with another corrupting touch. Banshees don't screw around. But Scanlan is able to backhand the Banshee out of existence with Bigby's hand. 
Around here is when Travis and Laura arrive on the set, but they've been listening in the car, so they're up to speed. And yes, they heard the party trying to open the door. Our group decides to leave a mark that they were here in case the villains return. The mark is part of the Dorolo Crest. This is what they're using as the symbol for the resistance. And Vax carves words into the door. Paylor lives in Whitestone. They sneak back to the rest of the party, but along the way they overhear some farmers begging for some sort of extension on their crops. But the agents of Sir Carrion don't have any sympathy for them. And the best you can make out is that there's an argument about uh, farming shipments and the ability to make dates and requirements. Uh, he shouts back to, uh, to the remainder, says, Listen, it is beyond my control. This is what has been decreed by Sir Carrion. That is how it will be. If you cannot provide, then taxes will be pulled. If you cannot pay, then there are far worse things we can take. Be on your way. This is a really useful technique Matt employs to heighten the tension in Whitestone. It demonstrates that the worst is not behind the people of Whitestone. There are real people who are going to continue to suffer and die. Whatever the Briarwoods are planning will probably be very bad for the people of the world overall. Certainly the fact that someone is building guns is itself more than enough of a threat to the whole of Exandria. But some of the folks in Whitestone won't live long enough to see these evil plans come to fruition if the party doesn't act now against the new nobles. And while I'm sure the party is focused on the Briarwoods, Matt is shifting their focus to other lieutenants they can occupy themselves with first. The party knows they can't just charge into Whitestone Castle, they need to deal with their enemies in town first. They've discussed taking down the giants one by one, but beyond that, they don't really have any sort of plan. Here, I think Matt is giving them an idea for how to tackle their numerous enemies in Whitestone, by putting one of their enemies in front of them, and showing what makes them such a problem. Arguably, he did the same thing in the previous temple when they found the notes on gun construction, although I'm not sure that qualifies, since right now the party doesn't even know who is building those guns or where that person is. In this scene, he's telling them everything they need to know about why Sir Carrion is so rotten. And of course, this scene serves a second purpose because the henchman asks who Percy is. Percy's still under a seeming spell, of course, but once again, this is a reminder of the tension in town. It's just a matter of time until the villains figure out who these strangers are, especially if they keep leaving notes. The next time they get spotted, it might not go so well. Back at the tavern hideout, Keyleth finishes her ritual, and as she does, right at the end, she wants to do something to enhance the spell and make it more powerful. We got this earlier in the episode as well, as she asked about adding a small trench for water to feed the roots, and Matt retconned the scene to say that she had done this before she'd actually started the ritual itself. Now, at the end of her spell, she wants to do something similar. She's trying to give the plant something that plants crave. No, not that. She wants to use her sunbeam spell in tandem with the ritual to give the sun tree more sunlight. She doesn't specifically say she's blasting it with a sunbeam laser, just that she wants to manifest the sunbeam spell as part of the effort to renew the sun tree. She leaves it to Matt to figure out how that might work, and Matt leaves it to the dice to determine whether or not this will work. She seems to know this might have been a bad idea. There's a chance she just made a mistake by casting this spell. So if that's the case, then why does she do it? Well, first, because saying something like, you cast an 8-hour ritual, is an extremely passive statement. D&D players want to roll dice, they want to do things, and they want to do whatever they can to stack the deck so they can succeed. Additionally, Marisha sometimes wants to try to use magic in ways that aren't exclusively restricted by what's in the books. I'm not talking about not knowing your spells, that's a different topic. This is just the idea that maybe, just maybe, magic could be slightly flexible. This is an approach I've actually seen from a lot of druid players in my own games as well, and I don't really know why that is. But moves like this come in part from the idea that the rules in the book are a starting point, not an end point. Sometimes, especially in narrative-heavy situations, players want to use these rules as a jumping-off point to try new things. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the situation, and it depends a lot on the DM. Your style as a dungeon master can determine whether spells can be adapted or adjusted. For example, in my case, I tend to say things like, if you spend the spell slot for Sunbeam, the spell doesn't have to have the exact effect from the book. Instead, I'll allow it to give you advantage on your roll to restore the plants. But that doesn't have to be true for everyone, and in fact, I don't think I'd use that approach every time. It would depend on the circumstances. But this gets into the question of whether you consider magic in the world of D&D to be as much of a hard magic system as the rules imply. Of course, Matt does generally operate from that mindset, so that's partially why so many people seem to think Keyleth doesn't know her spells. 
The other reason is that she started playing an 8th level druid in a brand new system and doesn't have the time to read the books between games and doesn't sit and memorize spells. So if you're the kind of person who does, that's great for you, but please climb all the way off the back of those of us who don't necessarily retain every spell from our character's class list in our heads. Thank you very much. But setting that aside, this approach is a sign of one type of playstyle, and a way to think about the world of the game as slightly more complex, maybe more versatile, than the rules in the book. So is that true in your game? I don't know. It's up to you. We'll probably do a whole other video about the storytelling friction between soft magic narratives and hard magic rules, but this is the same mindset we touched on when we talked about Vax's prank of shaving Grog's beard and Liam's argument that magic is mysterious enough that Grog might believe that it just happened. It's a different way of observing the world of the game. Again, we'll talk about it another time. And let's also talk about the role itself. I suspect there was already going to be a role, even when she was just doing her eight-hour plant growth ritual, and we'll get to why in a moment. But in this case, Matt specifically says she's trying to use a damage spell in a non-damaging way after an eight-hour ritual, so this is going to be hard. At a guess, the bare minimum she'd need to accomplish any of this, including just the renewal, is a, a 15. That's a decent DC for something as important as heal the sun tree in the center of Halloween Town. Maybe trying to use Sunbeam this way would be more difficult, so we can imagine that the DC is now an 18 or maybe a 20. But ultimately it doesn't matter, because she rolled a 6 for a total of 12. That was never going to do the job. But here's what happens. First, she sees some buds grow around the tunnel. The spell affects a large area, but the tree doesn't change or come to life. Second, Matt describes that Keyleth released a full Sunbeam spell as frustration for the tree not growing more healthy, and she starts a small fire on the bark. They put out the fire, and we get the third effect. There was some life restored to part of the tree. The trunk around the scorch mark is a more healthy brown. Keyleth tries to encourage it to grow, using, using druidcraft to metaphorically blow on the embers of the fire she's trying to start to renew this tree. And fourth, and finally, the healthy growth stops. All the new greenery in the tunnel withers, and the new health to the sun tree visibly, literally, drains down the roots and vanishes. The life force is drained away by something beneath it. Okay, wow, that was a whole lot of information, so let's break down why Matt described it that way. First, the spell worked. Greenery grows around the tunnel. That's also going to be important so Matt can use it as a visual signifier in a moment to demonstrate that the effect is not exclusive to the sun tree. But for now, it acts as a signal that Keyleth didn't completely fail to cast this eight-hour ritual. Second, because of Marisha's low roll, Matt has to describe that the sunbeam spell did damage. It's a damaging spell, and it's the only authentic way to represent that roll. But third, as we see the health return to the trunk, Matt is telling Marisha that the Sunbeam spell did not cost her the entire ritual. The ritual still took hold, it still had an impact on the tree. In fact, by describing how the health blossomed in the Sun Tree's bark around where it was scorched by the Sunbeam, he's almost saying this idea wasn't completely without merit. I don't know if that's how he meant it, but I think he saw how dejected his player was that she had functionally ruined the spell. And he wanted to clarify, no, you just got a little roll. The idea itself wasn't doomed to fail. Not sure how well that speaks to what her concern was, but it's always good to be as clear as possible with our players. And this narrative description seeks to do just that. And finally, he then describes all of the life she just generated vanishing. The plants all wither, not just the ones she hit with a laser blast. The sun tree didn't just die. Its life force was drained away from below. So it's either the ground or something beneath it. Anyway, the group begins to discuss what to do next, and Percy identifies their first target, Sir Carrion Stonefell. He's who everyone's afraid of, so if they can kill him and leave his body somewhere on display, it will go a long way toward improving morale in town. Scanlan and Grog are very enthusiastic about this plan, either hanging Stonefell from the tree or leaving him in some other grotesque way. Vex makes an aside comment that this is so messed up. Foreshadowing is a literary device. The party goes to sleep, and then Matt asks everyone for a wisdom saving throw. With advantage, thank you to Heroes Feast. Everyone rolls well besides Percy, who therefore suffers nightmares. And so Matt asks him to take a point of corruption. This will manifest for him as a slight tremor in his voice, and he'll find himself clearing his throat in moments of silence. And of course, the players identify the cost they're going to take every time they sleep here. The land itself is poisoning them, corrupting them. In the morning, they recast Seeming and head into town. They like to find another place to lie low, to keep moving where they sleep so the Briarwoods can't find them. Maybe they can spend the night in Sir Carrion's house after they assassinate him. And they also need allies. They visit a curiosity shop Percy liked as a kid, 
but the shop is ruined, the door torn off, and the roof caved in. They go to the Ladies' Chamber, a temple to Arathis in the center of town, which features a half-dome amphitheater. As they arrive, there are just a few people there, listening to a sermon from Keeper Yenin. Side note, in the cartoon, Yenin is a woman, but he was a man in the livestream. After the sermon, Percy takes Yenin aside and asks his feelings on whether there's any hope in Whitestone. They're trying to get a sense of whether Yenin can be trusted and whether he can help inspire hope in the other citizens. I, I have a prayer to give. <clears throat> Interesting. I pray for a day to come when outside forces can rally the people of Whitestone again. That strangers may come and bring with them salvation and that the people will seize it. Speak in strange confidence for a traveler. Look for signs. Keep your hand in. Look for signs. I'm going to hand him a piece of parchment. Signs of what, if I might ask? Salvation. Good day to you, sir. That's cool, that's cool. Everybody act cool. Really cool. cool. We, we walk south. Close your eyes, close your eyes. We walk south, really. <laughs> and, I, cool. and you know what I've left him. They move on to the house of Sir Carrion Stonefell. As they prepare to, you know, do an assassination, Keith asks if Percy is sure about this. She has no objections about killing these villains and stopping them from hurting the people of Whitestone or making guns. Of course these people need to be dealt with. But her concern is also for Percy's sanity. He says that if they think he's sleeping, they should let him know. And with that, they prepare to infiltrate the mansion. They bend the bars of the gate and sneak into the house, and then they listen in and hear Sir Carrion speaking with one of his thugs, the one they encountered earlier in the episode. And the conversation is laden with irony. At the very least, we should have to be ready, prepared. If, uh, if what the Lady Briarwood says, we should be having visitors any day now, and I would hate to be caught flat-footed. So, we're going to go ahead and gather our arms. We're going to make sure that we outfit the place the best we can. Traps, alarms, whatever is necessary to make sure that we are not caught off guard. <laughs> <laughs> this is about to be hilarious! <laughs> <laughs> you guys came at just about the right time. <laughs> now, what Matt is implying is that this conversation was already going to happen at this time, and they happened to arrive in that window of time. And it's possible he did have a note that Sir Carrion's goon was going to come talk to him at this time, and I can't say for sure that that wasn't the case. But if it were me, here's what I would have done. See, the cast said they were going to go deal with Sir Carrion first, and that was before the break. So, during the break... I would have taken this opportunity to write this scene. Breaks during D&D games are great for exactly this reason. Give everyone a 15 minute break, maybe every hour and a half, and you'll have a built-in system for moments like this when you need to regroup and make plans. So yeah, I would have written this script out then. That way, once the players reach Sir Carrion, if they chose to eavesdrop first, they get to hear that, yes, the bad guys know they're coming, but don't know they're here yet. What does that do? Well, it tells them that their stealthy approach has worked thus far, and encourages them to keep using smart tactics. It establishes that their cover hasn't been blown yet by the events at the First Temple, and that the bad guys haven't noticed the party's efforts thus far to foment a rebellion. It makes the players feel smart and capable and cunning, which is extremely valuable considering they spent 20 minutes trying to open a door. But of course, the drawback of a scene like this is that it's awfully convenient. Oh, the party just happened to arrive at this guy's house right as he's talking about the party? I can imagine Matt being self-conscious about that feeling too contrived. That's something I would also worry about if this were my game. But a scene like this is also way too fun to not do just because it's contrived. So how does Matt reconcile this? Simple. He acknowledges how convenient it is and tells them, oh yeah, you just happened to get here in time to hear this. It's really funny. If it were me, that would be a lie. This would really be a scripted event, waiting for them when they arrive. But the players don't need to know that. This is a skill we see a lot from Matt Mercer. I've talked about it before, and it'll definitely come up in future episodes as well. Matt is excellent at villainous cutscenes. We don't completely cut away, the POV still stays with our heroes, but he'll have these scripted events waiting to play out, to make sure the players get critical exposition. For more on the subject, check out my video on episode 3 of the Vox Machina campaign. The party kicks the door in and ambushes Sir Carrion, his henchmen, and a few guards. As another note, in the cartoon, Sir Carrion looked like a 
little gargoyle. He might actually be a Duragar. In the live stream, he just looks like a handsome warrior. We drop into initiative, so here are the highlights. Our heroes get a full surprise round, six extremely motivated players unleashed in this room, and it's a bloodbath. Grog uses Great Weapon Master for the first time, Scanlan casts Dominate Person on a guard, Vax gets to deal all the joyful damage of acting before the bad guys and deals more than 80 damage to Carrion. And all the while, our players still look like dirty, ragged peasants. Once Percy starts shooting Sir Carrion, black smoke begins to billow out of his eyes and ears, seeping off of his chest and the hand holding the gun. And now Percy is dealing an extra d6 of damage. Liam suspects that Percy has taken a multi-class in Warlock, but to pull back the veil, he just took the Magic Initiate feat, which allows him to cast Hex once per day. He also got two cantrips, Minor Illusion and Friends, but those really won't come up very often during the campaign. Interestingly, Carrion sees the gun in Percy's hand, and assumes Percy is Dr. Anna Ripley, one of the enemies whose name is on Percy's gun. And now the party knows who in Whitestone has been trying to build guns. Once again, what a wonderful way to establish an exposition. Genuinely awesome to include that. Carrion has fighter levels and wields two rapiers. That's pretty cool. The goon he was talking to, who we learned is named Master Valk, is a spellcaster. They'd be quite formidable, if not for that surprise round. And then Percy finishes off Sir Carrion. And we get this important moment. The first time Percy gets vengeance on someone whose name is on his gun. So Percy, <laughs> how do you want to do this? <laughs> You said that weird. The smoke is pushing you. Vengeance. 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 Repeatedly echoing in the back of your mind. How do you want to do this? I'm going to put on the mask since I'm still under. He still doesn't know who I am. Mask. Okay. You, reach up, you pull the mask down. The, the bird peaked element of the mask now wreathed in smoke, resembling very closely the entity that made the original bargain with you. I'm going to walk up to him. Okay. This is for the Drolos. And let me say, you were the one I was least looking forward to. Oh, that's some cold shit. With that, you kind of recoil from it, and just the voice echoes in the back of your head going, yeah. I'm going to drop the gun. You drop it, it remove my it. mask. Run to the to find something metal, something sharp anywhere on the table, and just start scratching off the name of the gun, and just like I'm gonna just go to a corner and just start to start scratching the name off. Okay. Keyleth clotheslines Master Vok and knocks him unconscious. Scanlan sends his dominated guard to tell the other guards coming to the room that everything is fine. And once there's a good gash in the name, I'm just going to sit down and breathe. Okay. As you finish gashing the name out on the side of the metal and start breathing, you can see the name itself begin to glow with a slight dull purple glow and burn away from the metal, leaving just the scratch marks. Hmm. That's... that's a thing. They have Scanlan's dominated guard stand facing the corner, and Vax gives him the old Kynan special, hits him in the back of the head, and knocks him unconscious. They shove a rag in Vok's mouth so he can't cast spells, and then bring him to consciousness and ask him some questions. Once they've done as much as they can with yes-no questions, Scanlan casts blindness on him, and they remove the rag and ask more questions. They ask what Lady Briarwood is, and he confirms she's not a vampire, but she's more dangerous than her husband. She created the undead giants. Vok tells them that the Briarwoods are working on something underneath the castle, and he can take them to the project room through a secret tunnel which Percy recognizes as the same tunnel he used to escape, which means Vok is most useful to them as a message, not a guide. Oh, also, he did confirm that he was part of the original Briarwood incursion into the castle, so if nothing else, that sure sealed his fate. Heads up, things are about to get graphic again. Percy suggests they take Vok's tongue and let him loose into the city to serve as a warning. So Grog rips Vok's tongue out with his bare hands, with a natural 20. Everyone starts to realize that was a lot more intense than they expected, but Grog is having the time of his life. Percy fires his gun into something and then uses the heated barrel to cauterize the wound in Vok's mouth and carves the resistance symbol into Vok's forehead. He suggests they let Vok run loose and then burn the house down, and that's when Keyleth finally steps in, because things are going way further than they all expected. One, she argues that burning the house down sends a clear, immediate signal that they're in town, and so from a strategic perspective, that's a bell they can't unring, and she's not sure that's a great idea. I'll resolve that first. They debate that a bit, but eventually decide to just 
burn the house down anyway and go back to the tavern. They cannot spend the night in this house because there are too many guards left to deal with. But then they circle back to the main subject. Are we cool doing this? Not the assassination, but the graphic violence that came with it? I'm gonna let this clip play out for a moment because it's pretty important. It's one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. Wait, oh, hang on, hang on. People who are fellow half-elves, fellow half-elves, you look as horrified as I feel. How, what, what do you guys think? I feel like it's, it's a little stupid since we have nowhere to go. Well, we can go back to our old city. Hideout, we have the um, tavern. No one's found it. First of all, I know what you have been through, to an extent. Do you ever stay in the house? I don't even know what I've been through to a certain extent, but yes. We came here to wipe out a scourge on this city. Careful lest you become the scourge you've come to destroy. These people have eaten shit for five years. I'm not saying that man was innocent, but He's had a hard road. Everyone here has had a hard road. I am maybe willing to overlook what just happened for all the hardship you have had, but careful how you are walking. Hey, wait a second here, Vax. That was an enforcer. He kept the people oppressed. He worked for the Briarwoods and punished all of these farmers for not bringing enough taxes so and enough time. we into Jack the Ripper because of it? Well, that's what a rebellion is. I do like it's ripping. Kind of... There's no pretty way to do this. I agree that I'm fully there will be a moment for mercy, but he did not house. deserve it. I just it. feel like it might, you know, backfire a little bit. Look, we've all, I agreed to start a rebellion, let the people have their uprising, but I, I, I'm with Vax. I mean, I was trying to tell you this before we even came here, Percy. Very well. You don't want to become the thing that you are so desperate to seek vengeance on. Oh, How are so... we any different than the Briarwoods at this point? Uh, we're not fucking <laughs> vampires. Look, what are our options besides burning the house down? I'm open to other ideas. We can just leave it as a symbol of our terror. I've and... marked him, I'm willing to walk away. And where do we stay? Somewhere else. I agree with you with burning the house down. Let's find anyone who's in here and get them out, but I think they'll get out when the house we'll catches on fire. Your soul doesn't need to be forfeit, Percival. <sighs> Things are more complicated now. Percy, is that last barrel for you? No. Okay. And Good. if it was, would I tell you? No. Thank you. There's a lot here, and I genuinely think this is another tipping point for the campaign. First of all, I think this is one of the most frustrating times to read the Twitch chat, which is always a pretty miserable experience specifically because of all of the people complaining about how Keyleth sucks for talking about this and bringing this up, and then praising Vax for how he discusses the subject. They're saying the exact same things, except Vax is in favor of burning the house down, and Keyleth is not. So yeah. Boy oh boy, that's frustrating. But I want to talk about what exactly everyone is discussing, and how they feel. Let's start with Keyleth, because she starts this discussion. Keyleth is absolutely in favor of tearing down the oppressors and freeing the people. But something she's been worried about for this entire arc so far is the party going too far, and feeling justified in doing so because the bad guys are just so bad that they deserve it. In the last episode, she was so excited by the idea of building a rebellion and getting the people on their side, because in her words, it feels less like we're the United States. I think that analogy is so important to understanding Keyleth. Marisha understands that there are not a lot of other spellcasters or adventurers in the world who are as high level as them. And the longer they play, the more true that becomes. So this small group of people is starting to have the ability to go into other nations and, you know, topple dictatorships. And that's a lot of power for anybody to have, especially if nobody else elected them. Now we can split hairs on that analogy for days, it's not a perfect metaphor, but I do think there's a lot of truth to it. And more importantly, I think understanding this metaphor is a way to understand a lot of Keyleth's concerns, and sort of acts as a way to unlock the character. At least, that's how it was for me. Do you remember episodes 8 and 9 when Keyleth voiced her concerns around Lady Kima in the Underdark? One of her big sticking points was how many people they'd killed, and whether they had the right to do it. A hero is a violent wanderer who enacts their will bloodily and with strange magics upon the world. 
Remember when I played that clip in Critical Role Demystified Episode 9 as a summary of what Keyleth was worried about? Turns out, she was right to be concerned about this. In Episode 9, after Keyleth's argument with Kima, the party told her they would take her words to heart. In Episode 26, after the brutal murders of the broker and the old woman, they said they would keep her concerns in mind. Yet here we are, ripping the tongue out of some fool's mouth and doing assassinations, and feeling so righteous that they keep egging each other on to do worse and worse things. But the virtue of whether these actions are necessary is worth discussing, so there's an argument there. So let's see how the rest of the party feels about this topic. Percy seems to be of two minds. Part of him wants to pull off these horrible maneuvers because this is war, and war is hell, and this is a form of psychological warfare to take power from the Briarwoods and inspire the people to feel some hope. But also, another part of him is actually a bit disturbed to see it happen. He's stunned and a little horrified to see Grog actually do the thing he suggested, and hear Matt vocalize Vox's screams. Interestingly, his role in the campaign will evolve to the point where he will often suggest these ideas, horrible ideas about how to think pragmatically, how to win a war by embracing the worst parts of yourself, but then the rest of the cast will usually counterbalance him rather than just implementing those ideas immediately without consideration. Vex has been horrified by the gruesomeness of the mutilation suggested ever since the previous night, and seeing it in action did not change her mind. Vax is interesting, because before they went into the house, he took Grog aside and said the two of them were going to protect the others. Not by keeping them out of danger, but by being the two who will do the most murder, to protect the innocence of the rest of the party. So there's clearly a part of Vax that is comfortable with some gruesomeness. I mean, we know that he was fine with the old woman mage getting murdered in episode 25, but this scene clearly crossed a line, and an interesting question arises. Is it because the action is more horrible than what he was willing to do? Or because Percy suggesting these things means Vax failed to protect his friends' souls from the darkness of these actions? But I also think Scanlan makes a salient point. Sure, what they're doing is violent, but are they really going to argue that Vok didn't deserve punishment or retribution? Setting aside the fact that Vok is a spellcaster, so removing his tongue is the most permanent solution to getting rid of most of his spellcasting abilities without killing him, Scanlan seems to imply that, yes, they are going to have to do some terrible things as part of the rebellion, and seems to indicate this has always been a cost he's been prepared to pay. One criticism I see about Sam from Campaign 1 is that he doesn't take the game seriously. Even people who like him seem to say this is a way to juxtapose it with scenes from later in the campaign when he gets serious. And honestly, as someone who has been re-watching the entire campaign from the beginning, I really don't think it's true that Sam was never taking the game seriously. Even from the first episode, he's been reminding people to cut down on crosstalk, he's been taking notes and remembering NPC names, Yes, he makes a lot of jokes, he often tries to lighten the mood, but I don't think that's ever meant that he wasn't engaged with the story. I bring that up because this scene seems to me to demonstrate that Sam has always understood what they'd have to do. In this arc, I get the sense that he knew this would get dark, and he's never had a problem with that. But what's the lesson we can learn from this scene? Honestly, it's what Matt is doing, because he never offers judgment. He just has Valk react to the situation earnestly. And besides that, Matt just listens. I do believe he had discussions with the other players after this episode to talk about their alignments, and his recap in the next episode gives a recounting of these events with just a hint of stank on them to highlight how extreme some of this got. But during this episode, all he does is what he does best. He honors their choices. They want to tear out the guy's tongue and throw him out a window? He makes the sound effects and vocalizes the guy's screams. This is also a particularly good trick for games about morality. A lot of us DMs ask questions like, are you sure you want to do that? Or we even just repeat back to the players what they said. Okay, so you pull out his tongue? Like we're waiting for a second buy-in. Which of course is like the Monty Hall problem, which I've never understood, but I don't have to understand it for this analogy. Someone picks a door, and then you ask, are you sure? And that makes them second guess and start thinking about their answer in more detail. Is that your final answer? Same thing. It's our way, as Dungeon Masters, of giving the players a chance to maybe change their answer or stick with it. But for a story where you want their morality to matter, and you want the players to have to deal with the consequences of their actions, one approach that can help capture that idea is to not ask these questions. Sure, clarify when you need to, make sure you're understanding what they're asking. But if you know what they said, you know what they want to do, if you know they're being clear and asking again would only give them a chance to rethink their actions, well maybe you don't ask again. You just describe the consequences. Now, this is not a perfect solution for every situation, nor is it perfect for every group. 
Check out Matt Colville's video about time in D&D. He talks about how someone can say something drastic, like, I execute the prisoner, and then just resolving it immediately without giving anyone the chance to jump in or weigh in can ruin the fun of other players. But having this trick in your back pocket can be an effective way for the players to actually have to sit with their choices. Anyway, back to the recap. Keyleth concedes that they can go ahead and burn the house, but she wants to do it right, so she goes to the roof and burns the resistance symbol onto the roof. They drop Carrion's body on the steps to serve as yet another symbol of their deeds, and then they stealth away, making their way back to the tavern. The smoke fades, and it seems the rain and the efforts of the guards kept the house from burning down, but Matt implies that it probably would have left the symbol burnt into the roof. I think this is also deliberate on Matt's part. Keyleth wanted to burn the symbol into the roof, but... If the plan was for the house to burn down, that means there's only a very narrow window of time where the symbol would be visible before the house was actually consumed in flames. So we compromised, making it so that the symbol was left, but the Whitestone guards and the rain were able to keep the house from burning down. And that's the end of the episode, but at the end, Taliesin shares the drawings he's made of the Dirolo crest on the right, and the resistance symbol, which is on the left, and is just part of the Dirolo crest. Thank you so much for watching, we'll be back in two weeks with episode 30, Stoke the Flames. It's not as action-packed an episode, but we get some more discussion around Percy's black smoke and his mission for vengeance, and a renewed search for allies in town. And in fairness, there is an action scene in the episode, and it's pretty good. So we'll be back with that episode in two weeks. Before I go, I want to thank my incredible audience. This is my day job now, and your support means everything to me. We got to 25,000 subscribers earlier this year, and so I announced a giveaway. The 25 best comments from my Tiberius video would each receive a set of dice. So here are the usernames of the winners of that contest. Femke Boscher, Mr. Oderzut, Skip Plays Cello, Pedro Ivo Braun, Peter K, Star Lady, That Poem Guy, TG Thor, Disney Lover 258, Sophia Hart, Diana Isuz, Zen Bear, some YouTube account for videos, Johnny Sizemore, Tired Potato, Smoogie Boogie, Jordan Forberg, A Babbling Brook, Greg McNeish, Will Maltby, Austin Bristow, Anna, Alexander Chippel, Robin Hope, Tasman Jean. Message me on Discord or through the contact page on my website, both those links are below, and let me know your address and I will get a set of dice sent out to you. I have to say, it was really hard picking just 25 comments. The feedback on that video was overwhelmingly positive, and it was really wonderful to see you all get what I was going for. It was so amazing. So once again, thank you. If you want more videos between now and when I next do a Demystified episode, make sure to subscribe. I make awesome D&D videos every Monday and Thursday. If you wish the Critical Role videos were more frequent, support me on Patreon. The more supporters I get, the closer we get to my goal of being able to hire an editor to make these videos more often. That will happen at 1,000 patrons, and as of recording, I just reached 500. So it honestly would not take very many of you signing up at just $1 a month to make this series go weekly. Plus, this is my full-time job now, so any support you can lend would be greatly appreciated. If you can't support me financially, that's okay. You are always welcome in our Discord server, where we have a really cool community. It just hit 1,000 members. Please come and check that out. I also do live streams on Twitch. Follow me there to see those. And you can stay up to date with my latest news and updates by signing up for my newsletter. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. If you've enjoyed this episode, you'd probably like this video about how to handle torture in your D&D games when it comes up. It feels relevant to what we were talking about today. Until next time, play fair and have fun.